name is Melissa Case, and I'm chair of the Missoula County Democrats. And um, I'll be moderating this evening's event. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is start out by introducing uh, the two people who will be asking questions to the candidates, and that's Bruce Morris and Alice Campbell. Bruce is uh, the business representative for the Carpenters Local 28 here in Missoula. Bruce has been very active in Missoula party um, politics and will be a great labor um, perspective to tonight's forum. Alice um, uh, is from the north side, west side of Missoula, and Alice has been active in Missoula party democratic politics uh, for a very, very, very long time. Uh, Alice is also active in the Montana Coalition for Nursing Home Reform. She's been very active with the Montana Senior Citizens Association, um, and she has been continually and forever active with Women for Peace. Alice brings historical knowledge combined with a fresh per perspective for the future of Missoula politics. So I just want to take a second and let everybody know how it's going to work tonight. The uh, first portion of the forum will be questions coming from the two people I just introduced. And I've asked the candidates to keep their uh, answers limited. There are some open-ended questions, and I'm not going to try to cut anyone off, so we'll let people kind of go on a little bit. Um, and I've also asked that the um, people asking the questions and the audience keep questions to uh, keep questions limited to the type of question that can be answered in uh, about two minutes. So um, I'm going to let the candidates introduce themselves, starting um, with the closest to me and what ward they come from, and then we'll begin the questions. I'm Craig Sweet, and I'm a Democrat running in Ward 6. I'm Linda Tracy. I'm a Democrat. I'm running in Ward 2, which includes the west side and the north side, Melissa, but it also includes most of downtown and Grant Creek. I'm Leon Stalkup. I'm a Democratic candidate in Ward 6. I'm Bill Clark, a Democratic candidate running against the appointed incumbent Norm Laughlin in Ward 1. Um, Ward 1 includes the Rattlesnake, um, the eastern portion of downtown, uh, Cobblestone, and the Easy Street subdivision out by East Missoula, and uh, the dorms in the university area. And I'm Roy Burdett, another one from Ward 6 where we have four Democrats running. And it's very interesting because our is a gerrymandering type district, which starts at the Missoula River and runs in the Daily Edition area and clear out in the uh, far reaches of the city limit and then goes clear over to Higgins Avenue between South Avenue and North Avenue. So it's quite interesting. All right, then what we'll do is we'll start um, with Bruce, and he'll be able to ask a question, and then we'll just kind of tally back and forth between Alice and Bruce, and um, we'll start by doing the same sort of thing. Each candidate will have uh, an opportunity to answer the question, so we'll start with Bruce. Okay. Well, my first question um, has to do with something that's been bantied about quite a bit in the local press here lately. Uh, should city government go beyond providing basic services like fire, police, and roads? and take up issues like growth, quality of life, and open space. They already have a number of years ago. Uh, I was on the city council. I ran and won in 1979. I served on the city council until 1983, so I've been out of the city uh, uh, council for 10 years. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, John Toole, myself, Bill, Pot, or Bill Boggs, uh, several others uh, put together the open space uh, uh, committee and we uh, I went door to door to about 4,000 doors in Missoula and got the people of the city of Missoula or helped get the people of the city of Missoula to put $500,000 into a trust to acquire open space so it isn't a question as should we do it but uh, should we continue to do it and where uh, I think we were successful at that time because we had some obvious uh, candidates for open space. Mm -hmm. It was the old Milwaukee Railroad, uh, Railroad right away and uh, uh, Mount Sentinel. And uh, uh, there have been other uh, purchases made from that money, but they're substantially out of money now. I think government must, oh. must take a broader uh, approach than just fixing potholes and so forth, because who's going to do it if government doesn't? And the interests of the whole community are at stake. Um, for instance, with open space, with uh, trails planning, uh, that sort of, of stuff is essential as the urban area develops so that we retain anything in our natural environment left. And yes, uh, 
government has to it has to be involved in more of those things. MCAT is another example where uh, government has a chance to do more than has been done in a long time to facilitate um, public expression and broadening of people's minds, which in this age of a lot of violence, I think is what we really need. I think the only thing I would add to that is that I believe that we have to get out in front of growth and that we have to manage growth or we'll lose the kinds of things that have kept people here in Missoula, the kinds of things that make Missoula a very special place to live, and the kinds of things that keep attracting people here. I think that we can't stop growth, but we have to manage growth. We have to plan for growth. And I certainly feel that that's a role that the city government needs to be very active and involved in. Yeah, I think um, the one thing that people haven't mentioned yet, too, is that I think um, there has to be a, a lot of strong leadership coming from our council. Um, a lot of people out there would just as soon have the city provide just basic services, but what makes a city a whole, what makes it a place to live, is, is the open space, is, um, you know, things like MCAT, uh, a council that's involved, actively involved in, in making, ha working to help find affordable housing for people, um, actively involved in, in bringing about economic development and getting a handle on the growth that's occurring deciding where that's going to occur, um, working toward keeping our, our air clean, our water uh, clean, that type of thing. And and as um, someone said down there, you know, if the city doesn't do it, who, who will do it? I'm a great supporter of deer. I've been a, a hunter and a, a darn poor cameraman, but I like to take the pictures too. And there's a beautiful bunch of deer out beyond the for, uh, the Bitterroot River out beyond the old fort property and there's my wife went out there with me and one night and just from the highway we counted 100 deer in the early fall in the evening just before dark and I took my grandson out there about two nights later and he was disappointed he only counted 99 but so far that property I think might be available at a fairly low cost and it would be wonderful if the city or city and county together could get a hold of some of that land which currently is almost idle and it's the river bottom land where the deer go into the river bottom during the day and there's no hunting allowed in that area but maybe thank god there is no hunting because it's developed into a great herd and it's very very interesting and you can see them from the highway and i would suggest that many many people point that out and I would hope that maybe somehow the government agencies together maybe could get a hold of that land as well as certain areas in the South Hills. I took two of my grandchildren to school the last two years because they had a family problem of cancer in the family and going up the South Hills area, it's beautiful to see those little deer alongside the road and I hope somehow we could make a park along that draw which you come to before you come to the site of the new school. That's another thing that was very attractive to me. So I hope that somehow government agencies can work together and get access of that land. Thank you. Alice? Um, why do you see yourself as the best candidate in terms of the Democratic Party platform and I emphasize platform I think that's real important that you emphasize platform um, it's long been my contention that there are some Democrats on the current City Council who uh, pick and choose those areas in the party platform that they want to support and advocate on uh, City Council and some of them get quite quite far away from what are party platform is and um, I think they should come a little bit closer to home on that area I, I think you know what we've done in Missoula County in terms of putting together a platform what we've done statewide in terms of putting together a platform it's a very good platform and it's a very common sense platform and it's a platform that that works well for working people it's a platform that um, recognizes the need to protect open space to provide clean water clean air it's an, uh, a platform that uh, recognizes the need to encourage other forms of transportation beyond the automobile that encourages people to bike and to walk and to plan our cities that way. It encourages parks and open space. Um, 
it says a lot to veterans. It says a lot for um, you know pe people who um, at the time might be a little down on their luck. I think it's a good platform, and um, as I say, I'm really disappointed sometimes that some of our current city council Democrats uh, seem to ignore that we have this platform. I've been uh, carrying around an article that was in the Missoulian uh, on the 2nd of September in which it's entitled, The Chamber Gives Republicans the Edge on Business Votes. And this was uh, an interview that was done with David Owen. And uh, uh, he s says that he agreed that the ratings reinforced the pro-business pro label often attached to Republicans. And he said that Montana businesses won several major battles during the session. Owen cited the defeat of bills increasing the minimum wage and uh, the defeat of bills that would have restricted the location of hazardous waste burning plants. Um, lawmakers' decisions to have employees help pay off the workers' compensation deficit. I mean, this kind of a thing is what Republicans do a lot. Uh, the, uh, uh, the hazardous waste bill would simply have kept um, hazardous waste plants from being within three miles of a creek or three miles of a school. Um, the minimum wage law, I mean, the, the minimum wage is not a living wage. We need to have more of that. Uh, I mean, this is, this is the sort of reason that I would run as a, uh, as a Democrat, not a Republican. And um, I know that, that in my ward I have a, a very strong challenger who's a Republican, and I like him and everything else. And I've, I've had people tell me, though, that, that you know, no matter how nice a guy he is on the local level, if you end up supporting a Republican, you end up supporting Republican policies at the state and national level, and you have to take that into account. So um, I consider myself a solid Democrat. Linda, Leon, Roy? Well, political distinctions are important. However, uh, I hesitate to, uh, if I'd, I'd feel bad if I didn't point out that the platforms, uh, I don't know what it is anymore, but it used to be 27 pages long, and most Democrats uh, don't read it closely. And uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that someone's not a Democrat because they didn't particularly agree with one piece of uh, some obscure sentence in that platform. I've, I've never been supportive of a party that's very narrow in perspective, and that's basically what our platform should be, as wide as possible, so that we can... Uh, the argument shouldn't be over our goals. The arguments always are over how we get there. And uh, uh, if you so narrowly define things so that the argument is how you get there, uh, then uh, both parties are in trouble. I think the bottom line that I come back to in answer to your question, Alice, is that the platform seeks to identify some specific areas and some specific um, uh, approaches to resolving problems and uh, some specific philosophies. And I believe that that is an important process to consider those, to develop the platform. But I, I think I still view, as Leon does, the platform as a living document, as a guide, as something that evolves over time. And, and while you may not necessarily agree with every, every dotted I and, and crossed T, that it does give us that guideline and that basis for democratic candidacy and running. Right? Yes, I was on <coughs> Missoula Mineral Human Resources for several years, and I was always interested in uh, low-income people getting a, a little better break, which I see is improving as years go by as to what it used to be. It's not to the standard that I had hoped for, but it's improving, like aid in electric bills for families who really need it and are not really getting an ample income from Social Security and various other sources which are very minimal and it and the sources often discourage especially a mother from working if she has children at home so they need these things they need the heat bill help that i'm sure the democrats helped far more than our opponents in getting aid for heat bills for the needy people also insulation of houses i know of a few in town that have had their houses insulated and that was either totally paid or subsidized by government agencies. And I think that's wonderful and it needs to be enlarged so that people can 
live in a low income status and still not lose their pride of accomplishment and living in their own home and so forth. Bruce? Okay. Um, we're all concerned about jobs for our citizens in Missoula and um, I get, my question is real simple. How do you think the city council can help to create or encourage uh, good paying jobs for its citizens so that people can uh, uh, get a little piece of the American dream and, and uh, uh, we can take some of the burden off of city social services? That's something I've been wondering about. You know, it's like we're getting ready to have a new Walmart come in here. And um, heirs to the Walmart family are uh, in the top 30, 30th, I think, richest people in the world. And the continual accumulation of vast amounts of sums in the hands of a few um, is a worry because when that happens, then there's a lot left, a lot less left to go around for everybody else. Um, it almost seems like that there should be some way with a company like Walmart that wanted so much to, to come here. And I'm really glad that, I mean, I'm not certain sometimes that I wanted it here, but I'm glad if it had to come that the uh, commissioners made them jump through the hoops they did because I've seen communities where the Walmart simply arrived on the scene and went in and they were ugly a lot of times. So ours is going to be better than that. But I mean, I wonder if there couldn't be some way with a company like Walmart that wants to really come here if they wouldn't have to pay more than minimum wage or something like that as part of the deal. Um, that would put them at a disadvantage in relation to the other companies that are presently here, so I'm not quite sure how this could be worked so that it, it made sense. But um, a big company like that coming in is certainly going to threaten a lot of local businesses. That's the history throughout the country where Walmart comes in, and it seems like they should have to make some concessions. I'm not quite sure, as I say, how you'd get equality between Walmart and Shopco and Costco and all that sort of stuff. But um, as long as it didn't end up being, you know, a sort of an approach that kept business out and it was, it did achieve more fairness, I'd be interested in looking at that sort of thing. I, I think that we can, um, as a council, I think we can be aggressive in seeking out business that. Um, we think would be compatible with our environment and what we're what we are all about here in Missoula, and I think to some extent we we should be asking them questions as to how they treat their workers, you know, in terms of with respect, in terms of benefits, in terms of providing childcare, in terms of the wages they they pay. Um, I think one of the most important things that we can do is encourage competition because that's going to increase wages when there's competition. And, um, you know, the fact that uh, maybe wages are a little low in Missoula right now is that um, because there are, really isn't that competition necessarily for those good workers yet. And that, that could come about as we start to bring in uh, not just Walmarts, but maybe the type of uh, non-polluting light industry that can provide better jobs. Obviously, if they're providing better jobs at a better wage, there will be competition, and these people who have been paying a lower wage, if they want to keep those folks, are going to have to start paying a, a higher wage. I think government can go a little too far in meddling in and trying to manipulate an economy, but I think, you know, I don't think you can go far enough in terms of trying to aggressively seek out good, good uh, businesses to do business with in your community. Um, the growth is going to happen, and and uh, people are going to need jobs that pay good money. And um, I think we just have to be more on top of it. I think what happened with Ross Electric um, was a shame. Obviously, someone was snoozing on the job. They did not do the research. They did not do the homework. They did not see that these people were incredible uh, violators of the environmental protection laws. Um, and I would have a feeling if they were willing to violate the EPA laws, they probably didn't. They probably don't treat their employees very well either. And all it would take is a visit to one of their factories to see what they're doing, and um, a few phone calls, and, and that wasn't done. And that's the very least we should be doing as council people. I think we could do even more. One of the things that uh, I'd caution is that <coughs> well, as we've talked about, or our firms that uh, are going to move here from somewhere else. The vast majority of job growth in this town, as in other towns, is from uh, uh, local firms growing and expanding. Uh, and there are several things that one can do to, uh, uh, to nurture small firms. 
one of the uh, one of the great uh, uh, impediments of the development of business is uh, uh, financing. Uh, <laughs> many of our local banks and lending institutions are are uh, somewhat lethargic and being aggressive and trying to. Uh, put together uh, financing packages for uh, small firms that want to expand in the Missoula market. Uh, so it's not only just the interest rates, but it's the availability of the financing itself. And uh, you mentioned uh, jumping through hoops. Uh, one of the things that business people are always looking at is, uh, is they don't want to do something if they don't have some potential for success. Uh, and so if you put too many impediments, particularly the people that are here and that we understand and they know us and we know them, if you just try and put impediments in their place, uh, then even the financing availability won't help. Uh, we, have to, we have to look at what we have and, uh, and try and accentuate the ones that have, have been doing a good job and trying to help them along. I have to say that I'm still learning about the specific kinds of things that council can do in the whole area of developing. Uh, jobs and developing a stable and diverse economy. The kinds of things that I've been hearing as I've been going door to door is a strong concern about having uh, the ability to find a job that's more than minimum wage, to find a job that has some security to it, to find a job that has some upward mobility so that you can continue on, on your career path. Uh, but still I come back to your first question and that asked what was the role of city government in looking at some open space issues, growth issues, and, and planning for growth. And I come back to uh, some of the experience that I've seen in other communities where growth has not been managed and where you have a situation where development, economic development, cannot take place because of traffic congestion that won't allow any more traffic through a narrow corridor and communities that have had create some very innovative solutions to those kinds of problems. So I have to get back to what kind of a climate in general we offer for economic growth. Uh, at the same time, I'm concerned about a move that seems to be going more toward the service industry. And I recognize that many of the kinds of jobs that seem to be uh, promoting or seems to be servicing the tourist trade don't seem to be very high paying jobs and I don't want Missoula to be caught in a situation where we've got people working for minimum wage who have stable jobs but can't afford to live here in Missoula. So I see a lot of, of that balance and that uh, uh, working together both in a couple of different arenas simultaneously. All right, right? Yeah, I'd like uh, to vary just a little on this. I think we need a lot of closer look at hiring local people for both the city and county jobs. I don't like this nationwide search for an employee. It just irks me. It reminds me of the years ago when we hired two city managers and one was a failure and one was worse. And there's nothing wrong with the city manager government as there's nothing wrong with any government except the people you choose. So uh, I would hope that whoever is in government here, both in the county and in the city, Take a good look at the business college out here at the university. The business administration section of the State University of Montana is the biggest part of the school here. It's a real nice qualified thing. And I think they ought to be included somehow a little more closely in the hiring for City Hall, for the county. And as this county seems to be exploding as far as population, and businesses go and so forth, surely the services are going to extend and expand in accordance with that. So I would like a better look at the university graduates. The other thing that's been kicked around a lot, and I've heard it from both my friends in business and in labor, is giving incentive tax breaks to people who come in and build something to get them to start in Missoula. I think that's a poor attitude. I don't think you need that. I think if a company is real good and there's a good possibility of success or probability of success, they'll move in anyway if the probability is there. They will move in. I don't think you need to promise them a darn tax break. I don't like that. And a tax break, some people even go so far as to give tax break to somebody like Walmart or somebody if they will just plant so many bushes or something. I don't think you need to give them that kind of a tax break. I think we have now 
a city that and a county government mm -hmm. that's trying to beautify the whole Missoula area. And I think Walmart or anybody else that comes in now has to face the fact that they're going to reasonably beautify their area anyway. That's going to come. And I agree with all the other candidates and that doesn't sound very political, but I agree with all of you. Somehow we've got to get above this minimum wage category that associates itself with basic retailers. All right. Alice? Uh, please present your views on the balance between private uh, property rights and the common good in terms of planning and zoning. Now, I know we've talked about planning before, but I'd like you to expand on that. I've, uh, I've seen many times, uh, well, I grew up in Vermont, and um, back in the 60s in Vermont, uh, there was a lot of uh, people moving into to the state, and the state recognized there was a problem that uh, valuable agricultural land was being subdivided rather rapidly. So the state government told the counties, you come up with a comprehensive land use plan or we'll make one for you. Well, obviously there's all these howls. We don't want the state government telling us how to, how to you know, plan for our growth or what we can do with this land. And um, so some were a little slow in enacting some comprehensive planning and the state did some of that for them and some of them did enact comprehensive zoning. But what happened was, you know, there would be a dairy farmer and he, he would have his farm and down the road uh, one of his neighbors would sell their dairy farm. And suddenly there's a Walmart or a Kmart being built and all of a sudden their attitude changed. Hey, you know, maybe there's something to this planning for open space. Maybe there's something to some land use planning and um, because they would see a way of life disappearing. I mean, when the dairy farm started being bought up and subdivided and Kmart's came in and, and uh, little ranchettes came in, it really worried a lot of those old, you know, farmers, and um, they changed their attitude. I think, you know, you, you have to, you know, and you do have to come down on the side of the public good many, many times when it comes to land use issues. Um, obviously, obviously, you know, we have to be very clear about that in terms of our zoning ordinances and and um, describing where people can build and what they can build what type of uh, building or business they can put in. We have to make that very clear. And there has to be good reasons for, for um, those regulations. And uh, I think if, that's, if you do have good, clear regulations and, and zoning ordinances, then uh, people know, you know what the playing field is going in. And I think, um, I think that's important. The, uh, uh, I was involved in the 1975 uh, comprehensive plan and that was developed. And as it turned out, that wound up being a fairly significant document. It was one of the first in the state, and it was certainly the first that Missoula had. And it did make an inventory of, uh, of uh, what lands and what uses would be used in, uh, in various locations and uh, uh, gave some guidance. Uh, over the years, uh, zoning, uh, there was spot zoning done because of the fact that we have two separate government forms here. Uh, they didn't pay enough attention to each other, and so they began to do spot zoning. And, uh, they broke the plan uh, so that the, what the people had decided was uh, the plan for Missoula uh, didn't wind up being reality. Uh, in 1985, it was redone, and uh, frankly, that document uh, is not as significant as the 1975 document. Uh, another difficulty that, uh, that, uh, that has to do with that, Alice, is the tax system that Montana has. As Craig says, you have agricultural land and it's taxed at a lower rate. And as development encroaches and we don't force infill, uh, the land tax value goes up because of the potential for development. And in many cases, the guy can't make enough in the agricultural uh, setting to pay the taxes. Or uh, if the family, uh, the kids grow up, they don't want to be farmers. They live on the edge of the town, they're going to be developers. Uh, our excessive reliance on, on the property tax system to fund local government and schools has uh, is caused many of the problems. I have to come back to that balance of uh, the private property rights and the common good and, and work toward the concept of 
um, partnerships where the plans that are developed are developed in a better partnership between those who are going to be affected and uh, those who are actually doing the work for the, the city agencies involved. Uh, as I've been talking to people, people have been concerned because they don't feel that anyone is listening to their concerns, that uh, anyone is asking them their opinions. And I realize that we've tried to do, we've had some strategies where we've tried to involve the public through a public um, involvement process, and certainly the Vision 2020 process was working toward that goal. But I, I believe that we have to create uh, new strategies to make a better partnership between citizens who are really the experts in their own problems and needs and those working in agency, uh, city agencies that have a broader view of the overall picture and the trends and the uh, needs for open space development that an individual neighborhood uh, resident might not necessarily be uh, considering. Bill? This is <coughs> one of the I think most pivotal questions. I mean, this is really the question where the rubber hits the road, in my opinion. Um, there's no question that private property rights are extremely important to this country and are extremely important to people that live in this country. Um, but the common good represents really sort of the ethical limitations that you would want to put on private individuals who go too far. I think we have a real evidence of a lot of, I don't know how else to call it other than greed in, in the way a lot of people are handling their private property. Um, when somebody, for instance, and I'm not, say, I'm not trying to call these particular people greedy, but let's say somebody owns a particular piece of land that has a lot of value to the community and um, they simply want to put houses on it and they want to make all the money they can out of doing that. The community cannot always afford to go around and buy all that open space. I'm really glad for the work that Leon did uh, to get the prior conservation bond going, but you know, as the community expands, the circle of land that we have to acquire is constantly getting bigger and the prices are always going up. And uh, we can't always depend upon the community to be able to purchase that. It would bankrupt the community. Um, the fact that we even have to is one of the ideas in my mind that signifies that maybe we're becoming overdeveloped. We're, we're, we've experienced too much development in the Missoula Valley because um, we're starting to have to do all of these things to compensate for growth and all of these become very expensive. Um, so while, while I really uh, appreciate that private property is extremely important, um, I'm very aware also that we're getting into a situation like what happened in the Rattlesnake where the mayor finally said during a planning and zoning meeting when it looked like that the current city council was going to propose the highest density zoning up there and, and Mayor Chemist said, I will not sign uh, a bill that is the result of the city being held hostage by four developers. And that's what we're getting down to. People that have, uh, people that have no sense of enough being enough that don't bother to self-restrain themselves. And uh, I think the community is going to have to do it. The community is going to have to zone for open space in many cases because we can't afford to pay for it and we have to have it. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue and I think about it a lot. I think too, Bill, um, that in those areas where some developers are pushing for, for a higher density, that it also, uh, presents an opportunity for us, for the city to say, okay, um, we'll allow that higher density provided some of these houses are of moderate, uh, in the moderate price range yes. as, a, as a form of trade-off, which, ahead. you know, jumps into a, affordable housing issues. One more example just briefly of how this is affecting Ward 1. Um, the Van Buren Street is um, going to have to be widened if we develop much more of the rattlesnake. And yet, uh, that's going to cause enormous impacts to the people who live on there. There are some people whose houses were built without any off-street parking at all, and they don't have alleys, and so if Van <coughs> Buren is widened, they're not even going to be able to have to park their cars anywhere near their homes. Now, is it fair to cause these people to suffer that extent just so we can put more houses up at the other end? I mean, don't we at some point have to consider that while we might like to have more houses up there, it's going to impact these people so much that it will really make their lives 
much less convenient and comfortable for them. I mean, I think we have to. I think the community has to do those kind of things. Right. Well, I would uh, be almost on the other side. The city and county must work together and develop these areas. And there someday just has to be a different route or a better route up the rattlesnake. If you develop or if you don't develop, they're going to squeeze in and they're going to be more and more. And there's going to be a large sewer up the rattlesnake eventually, and we must face those things. Now, uh, when I first went to Long Beach, California, it was almost all wheat fields and orchards between Los Angeles and Long Beach. I was just out of high school, and that's the way it was. Now it's almost total housing. And we have to face the fact that these things are going to develop, and hopefully it won't have to be as big as Reserve Street out here, but also, hopefully, that someday there will be a street up the Rattlesnake far beyond what Van Buren is now. And it might entail what we call the common good again. Sometimes the city and county or whoever the governing agency is has to buy that property, has to condemn it, has to take it from the person at a good price, a good fair price, often judged in court. Then when that property is bought, that owner should get a real reasonable price for it, a real good price for it. But they had to do that out on reserve, and as all you people know, that's why reserve took so doggone long the con condemnation of the property abutting Reserve Street out there where that much needed arterial is, had to be condemned in order to get all property ready to do the work. Now, I think that city and county need to work together very, very much, and I would hope that the county would help us out in this with the city-county planning and develop a nice plan for the rattlesnake, because we just can't sit here and maintain the idea we're going to have all those elk and deer on the hills and the rattlesnake forever. We've got to figure that sooner or later, houses are going to be built there, not totally maybe, not the wrong kind of houses, but it's going to have, be an area of considerable growth. I hope that somehow we can work together and make a nice big drive up there, a nice sanitary system, and take care of the problems. And like I've repeated already, it would make me very happy if the county and city would get together and work far more closely together on advanced planning. Bruce? Oh, my turn. Your turn. Um, Okay, I've got a question that's going to show my bias as a business representative for the Carpenters Union. Uh, the Wagner Act, or the National Labor Relations Act, as it's referred to nowadays, uh, was passed by Congress in 1935 uh, at the behest of Franklin Roosevelt, who was president at that point. And uh, as I believe, Roosevelt, uh, what Roosevelt had in mind was that by empowering workers to organize into unions, that that would help be one of the things that would help to bring this country out of the Depression. Uh, the Wagner Act, in fact, in the preamble, encourages workers to organize unions. We talked earlier about good-paying jobs, uh, the minimum wage jobs that are proliferating in this area. I guess what I have is a two-part question. Uh, one, do you think the Wagner Act or the National Labor Relations Act is still applicable in what it says in the preamble? Uh, and secondly, if, if you do, then how do you see your role as a city council person uh, to in, do you see a role for yourself as a city council person to encourage uh, workers in their pursuit of organizing into unions in Missoula and how? That's not. Who wants to tackle that one first? The, uh, I, I, this, I suspect, gets back to something that, uh, that I said before. There are several ways to get to the promised land. Uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult question, uh, oh. not, in, uh, not in philosophy, but in, in practicality. Uh, I believe in collective bargaining. The, uh, uh, I think probably most of the people that are on the city council or that run for the city council are, are believers in an effective uh, uh, collective bargaining uh, position for all workers. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned before, and we've, uh, several of us have mentioned it uh, since then, uh, the minimum wage. <laughs> 
that may not be the best tool available uh, to get people out of uh, uh, low-paying jobs. It's an interesting, uh, uh, it's an interesting thing how as thing goes around, they come around. Uh, George McGovern, uh, fellow that I voted for, <laughs> thought much of. Uh, he thought that we ought to have earned income tax credit, and uh, it was hooted and derided by uh, most people who opposed him, and many Democrats, as a matter of fact. And uh, the Republicans uh, took up that uh, that uh, cry uh, 20 years later. And uh, maybe there's something to it in that uh, it, uh, it encourages work, which I think is probably more valuable than, uh, than, uh, than what it's always given credit for, instead of just talking about the raw figures that, <coughs> that a producer has to pay, to talk about alternative ways of paying, uh, even if the public has to participate in that. Uh, city government's not going to do anything about that. Uh, Probably the state government's not going to do anything about that because the Fair Labor Standards Act prohibits uh, uh, a lot of things, and it, it may even prohibit that from uh, from one state to another. But uh, I don't know what you can do uh, other than encourage uh, management and labor to collectively bargain. I think um, folks do have uh, a right to organize, and people should be able to. Um, if it comes to uh, going out on strike, be able to go out on strike without fear that their job will be permanently re replaced. Um, I'm a little interested to see if, you know, Leon, whether you think paying someone a sub-minimum wage is a way to encourage work or as a way out of poverty. I mean, you, we hear a lot about that. In fact, on NPR tonight, they were talking about sub-minimum wage. And, um, you know, a lot of people advocate that as a way to provide work for people. That doesn't provide work for people. It provides a sub-minimum wage for people. A far better way would be to uh, to look at alternative ways of, of doing it. The earned income tax credit's one, and you can. Uh, it, it doesn't have the same deleterious effects on the overall economy that uh, moving the minimum wage does. It depends upon who you want to benefit and who you want to hurt. And uh, the alternative uh, type things generally don't hurt anybody, and they they have a more positive effect. Maybe, Craig, you could just take a second to explain what sub-minimum wage, what do you mean by that? That'd be like a tip credit or something? That would be, that would be one, one example. No, that's, uh, that's high not school. really a sub-minimum wage. Uh, I understand your interest in that, but a sub-minimum wage is one that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, certain classes of people in America, uh, depending upon their age, can be paid in some states less than mm -hmm. uh, the minimum wage. That's what a sub-minimum wage is. Certainly, and I, wanted, I just wanted to try to clarify well, what his... No, I would think paying, paying um, you know, someone who's working, trying to feed some kids as a waiter or a waitress, and if they're paying them sub-minimum wage, I think that's, that's um, ridiculous. I th you know, I'm not even certain paying a high school student a sub-minimum wage so they can have a summer job is, is a good idea either. Um, sub-minimum wages and even minimum wages are not living wages. I think we all know that. Yeah. I agree with that. Linda? I have to say, Bruce, that I'm not familiar with the preamble of the National Labor Relations Act, but that I do support the concept of unions, and I am glad to have recently met you and know who I'm going to come to <laughs> to get a copy of that and to learn more about the... Or when about you need the a carpenter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh... The labor, I, I totally support the right of workers to organize, uh, but the point is when you look at the history of how it all came out, the labor union movement arose in one of the most brutal and horrific periods in American history. And it's a tragedy that that's the way we ever evolved into solving our problems we managed in the labor. And I wish that that uh, I, since the problem has typically come from management, I, I, I wish that there was just better thinking applied. And I like Linda's comment earlier about a partnership, you know? I mean, yeah, I, I think it's, I, I, you have to have the right to organize, but that's such an adversarial approach. I wish that just some better thinking could be brought to it. You know, it's like when, when uh, Leon mentioned the earned income tax credit. Uh, um, the problem with that is, 
it's a backdoor approach to achieving parity or, or to achieving a better wage that should have happened in the first place. That you get it, you get into the same problem with the welfare system. You have to pay welfare um, because people aren't earning a living wage in the first place, and so you end up creating a system that costs a lot of money to administer, uh, irritates a lot of people who think that it's a handout sort of a thing, and um, uh, sucks up a lot of money in the administration process. If if wages were simply better in the first place, so that we didn't have to depend upon. Uh, these expensive workarounds, you know, earned, earned income tax credits and, and welfare. Obviously, people are going to need welfare if they don't have any job at all. But I mean, the situation where you know, uh, you have to pay a you have to pay a bureaucrat ten dollars to end up getting five dollars additional to a worker. The money would be better spent if you just paid the worker better in the first place. And if there was a more partnership environment between uh, uh, labor and business. The sort of things you hear about that the Japanese do. I don't know that I believe everything I hear with that, but uh, yeah, I support the right to, to to organize and so forth. But I still wish that there was just a more of a partnership approach to solving these problems. Does that answer your question? Uh, brings uh, another view to the question. Uh, okay. I, I guess my response would be uh, that I believe collective bargaining doesn't have to be adversarial. Okay. I think you can have labor and management working together for the same goal. Bottom line is. What workers want is the same thing that capital wants, and that's to make a living. Right. Uh, the difference is that capital invests uh, um, capital and uh, to achieve a profit, and workers more often than not invest sweat to try to make a living. But bottom line is everyone wants to wants a piece of the pie. Um, and, and I guess I believe strongly in collective bargaining because I think that it's the only way that workers are going to have more of a voice. Capital is always going to have the upper hand, regardless of how strong unions have gotten in the past or may get again in the future. Uh, but it, it occurs to me that, uh, it seems to me that over the span of history in this country that when trade unions were, uh, had larger percentages of workers organized, that we had more uh, a more stable economy at those times and that during the times which uh, we're experiencing some of which now where the economy is not that stable uh, workers are getting paid low wages uh, that the level of organization is down and right now we're looking in this country where about 15 percent of the workers are organized back in the 50s after the second world war that was somewhere between 50 and 70 percent yeah, it shouldn't be a surprise that if, if workers don't have money, it's hard to have a strong economy. Absolutely. <laughs> the, uh, Henry Ford, uh, who was not necessarily a great friend to organized labor, but did recognize that uh, uh, if his workers <coughs> were producing a product that they couldn't afford to buy, and that was the reason for the, for, for the, uh, was the Model T, help me out here, right? Yes. <laughs> the Model T was a, was a product that the workers could afford with the wages that he was paying. Mm -hmm. And all too often today, Carpenters that I represent, uh, when they get an opportunity to build a house, a union house, uh, which is is not uh, is, is getting to be a rarity, they can't afford to buy the houses they're building. They're not making enough money, even though we collectively bargain. And I'll grant you that a lot of the non-union carpenters in this town that are building houses, there's no way they can afford to buy those houses. Bruce, the, I mean that's absolutely true, and it's also true of many of us that own our own house. If it went back up on the market and we had to pay for it market price, we couldn't afford to live in the house we now sure. own. Tell me how the city council can change those things. Okay, and particularly on the on the uh, the bargaining and uh, uh, wage issue. I'm I'm would agree that the city council can't have too direct a role in changing that. The way city government is set up, that's not yeah. possible. I guess the answer, or some of what I was hoping to hear, and I'm hearing some of it from, from all you folks, is that I think city council, the mayor, and the council take a leadership role as much as a lawmaking role. And uh, by uh, through that leadership role, I think there are avenues that council members, the mayor, can take to uh, encourage an atmosphere that's conducive to good labor management relations. I would uh, like to throw in an experience that I've had. I built my own house, but I didn't build my own house. I hired a union electrician to do that work, a union bricklayer to lay my fireplace and so forth. And sometimes when I see the mistakes I made carpenter-wise, <laughs> even with my blueprint, I wish that some of that would have been hired by a professional. So what I'm going to say and remind everyone is that 
when we talk about government, we talk about taking the lowest bid. And that's usually as far as a lot of people think. In fact, one of the best lawyers in town, at least best known, and one of the biggest law firms, once told me when he was uh, chairman of the high school board, he said, we have to take the lowest bid. And, uh, you know, with my small education, I looked at him and I said, now, come on, you know better than that. You're leaving out the famous word. And he hesitated and he said, well, what would it be? The lowest qualified bid. And that's one place where the unions, I believe, and the carpenter union especially, and the building trades have a real edge. You should and you are trained usually by an apprenticeship and you usually are quite well learned, learned in the use of your materials, the kind of materials, and what you're building. So I think this qualified bid is very, very expensive and should even be talked about once in a while in a committee in city government and in county government. You take the lowest qualified bid. You don't just say we take the lowest bid. Sometimes the bid for gas may be out of state or may be a little polluted or some darn thing. Maybe they haven't been always up to standard, you see? Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, real good if the city council, and of course I'm not running for the county, but county and government agencies would take a look at all of their acceptance of bids and see that they are proper. Now years ago, uh, some places in Missoula, they went beyond a four foot limit between houses. I think the limit in most cases now is six foot limit. And according to my own uh, little house, it would be nice if everybody had at least 25 feet between their house and the neighbor. Hmm. So uh, those things in the city building codes need to be looked at rather carefully, and I think you get a better product. I think we're going to take one more uh, question from Alice here, and then we might start wrapping this up. Uh, are we going to have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we'll take a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you, Maybe as a else. city council uh, member, advocate for a um, uh, achieving gender equality in the city uh, workforce? Gender equality. Right? Yep. Can I, since I'm the only woman on this panel here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as a man who has four daughters, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I found out uh, in raising those four daughters that, uh, that sexual equality means a heck of a lot to them, and it began uh, to mean a lot to me. Uh, it's, always, uh, uh, it's always surprised me that, uh, for instance, the fire department here doesn't have a woman uh, firefighter. Uh, the police department has uh, a couple of women officers. The sheriff's department does. It's always uh, the rural fire. Uh, I think uh, one of the assistants, for heaven's sakes, is a woman. Uh, uh, so there, uh, I don't know if the street department has a woman other than the secretary. It never used to. Uh, that's somewhat troubling. But we're talking about equality, so not if uh, job got equality. Those few uh, 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 gender <laughs> equality. I'm gender talking about equality. being able to get a job not based on what your sex is but based on your skills. Yes, but and also a little equality in numbers. Right, and I think part of what goes along with that too is is the development of uh, women's skills so that they are qualified for those kinds of jobs. And I don't think it's I don't think I would limit my concern strictly on the basis of gender, but I would want to see our city uh, employees be much more representative of the community that we live in and across all racial and economic and gender lines. Well, one simple way that, that, that the city could help that is just to be sure that, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, go ahead. One simple way the city could do that would just be to be sure that whenever it advertises for a job that it, that it ends up with a representative pool of people mm -hmm. and that it keeps advertising until it achieves that pool. Sure. Now, if I might, I'd probably make every woman in Missoula mad. And uh, here's the reason. You know that I was a fireman. I was a lobbyist for firemen. And I think it's great to have equal gender through the city on an average, but not in the fire department, not totally in the police department, especially not the fire department. For this reason, if you go to a large city, the average 
turnout crew that goes on a pumper truck is five to seven people. They've got to pull that hose, which is quite heavy. They need weight to do it. They need muscle. They need experience. Now, if, if it was New York, it would be really quite different because they have a minimal crew, five to seven. San Francisco in the outer neighborhoods has three to seven on pumper trucks. Now here's Missoula and Billings and Great Falls and all those. They're darn lucky if they ever have three on a pumper truck. The thing is, you're pulling much too much weight already. And you should, they should not have lowered the size of men. In my opinion, they should have done what Billings did many years ago. They had some dwarf people. Call them little people, call them what you will. But they certainly were not going to climb the ladders to the top. They weren't going to put a 120 pound or a 100 or 220 pound person on the shoulder and carry them down. Now I've heard this great attack on equality in fire services until it really seems to me that people are just way out in left field because right here, one block over here, I started to carry down a man that was about 240 pounds one time down a darn good old aerial. I had help about halfway down and then the guy started sort of falling down the rungs and I had to get off of the turntable and get down there and get him on my shoulder and this fellow was almost exactly the weight I was and I was in darn good shape then. I carried him over in front of what used to be a car dealer's place and there was a lady who screamed, my God, he threw him down to the sidewalk. I didn't throw him down the sidewalk. I could not hold him up anymore. You see? Now, then let's face reality. If you have, say, six firemen respond to a fire, and three of those are women who weigh under 130 pounds, and they've passed the test, and they've done the chin-ups and all that stuff, they are still not going to carry your old Aunt Susie out of the house if she weighs 220 pounds in a good effective and proper manner. So I'm for doing this, which is already being done. You ladies know this. Across the city and across the county, the ladies already have the edge, a big edge, in clerical work. I'm not saying you belong in clerical work. You could belong in leadership. You could belong in training. But not putting a sack of spuds on your shoulder and carrying it where you can't carry it. No, we'll concede uh, you that. Okay. That, that was, that I, was, won't. That was <laughs> I won't. Uh, I won't either. That was nearly one of the most sexist statements I've heard in a long time. Okay. Well, one of the first jobs I ever had out here was planting these trees that are out in front of this building. And I was on a crew with a woman who was probably, I don't know, five years older than me, ten years older than me. In the first couple of days, I, I thought, that's it, I'm not going to be able to do this. She worked me into the ground until I realized just what we were doing. And we were planting trees that weighed several hundred pounds, and um, she had no trouble wrestling those trees around, getting them in the ground, on and off the trucks. So, um, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, I, I think, you know, we can achieve some, as Linda said, we have to have um, city worker pool that, that reflects our community in terms of gender. And I, I have to say that, that if um, there are certain standards within the fire department that whether the individual happens to be a man or happens to be a woman, they still would need to qualify for that particular job. And to classify all women as 130 pound weaklings is, is really irresponsible in my But to classify them as getting 50 percent of those workers, those jobs, is really the opposite, isn't it? No, but the point is you could, I'm sure that if you advertise properly for the job, you could find women who could do the same work as men. Yes. The, the problem is when you, is, is, is when you have a woman who's qualified, but she's not able to be put on because she's a woman, and that's the problem. Yeah, I see. I agree. <laughs> and we know that happens. Yeah. We just have a little bit of time left, and I'm going to ask Andy or uh, Dave over here if they have anything they wanted to add, um, certainly any questions, any comments. Um, Anything from you guys? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Can you tell me when my time's up? I, I'll, I'll buzz you here. I um, I'm going to ask some questions. One on housing, or actually a couple on housing, and if I did come a little late, so some of these have been touched on. You know, just tell me so, and I'll ask. None on housing. Great. 
we all know housing is a big short. There's a big shortage of housing and affordable housing, probably more appropriate in um, Missoula area, Missoula County too. What do you see the city council role and to help alleviate that problem? Um, I and then I have some specific questions or things that I would suggest throw out to you that to see what you guys are feeling on. If you want to ask the specific role in housing as far as the city council, that would be a good start. And I just want to add, we do have two minutes left, so let's do it real quick. I'd okay, let me, let me throw out my suggestions and you guys can comment as you're going. One, there's some Title I money that's, um, that the city council is sitting on that um, should be used for community, low-income neighborhood development. Would you support releasing some of that? Which is support funding nonprofits or not funding, but support monies to nonprofits that are working on housing and or maybe turning over properties or lands that the city is now not in use of sitting on or maybe sitting on the tax rolls, what have you. And would you support? Um, I, that's that's plenty right now. Mm. Well, another thing that maybe could be done, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but subdivisions, for instance, are supposed to be in the public interest. I think that's still one of the requirements yeah, is, for a subdivision. Yeah. And as we realize that uh, people don't have affordable housing in Missoula, it seems like to me that we should be able to require that subdivisions address that in some form, you know. Yeah. We already require that they have to have a one-night park requirement. Maybe we can say that they have to contribute some money toward affordable housing. Okay, I hate to cut you guys off. We just have a minute here, and I just want to close up. And I want to, I want to make sure that I add that all the candidates running for election in the city, um, for city council, were invited to this forum. Um, and I'd just like to really thank the people who turned out and came because I think a lot was done here tonight. I think a lot of important questions got asked and answered and some really, really good, difficult issues were dealt with. And I think that'll benefit um, all of your cons potential or, or current constituents. So I think that's really important. And uh, I just want to make sure I thank everybody for coming and say hopefully we can keep up doing this. And, and I hope that all of you are committed to increased participation. Um, on the city council or off. I think the political process is difficult and complicated, but hopefully we can encourage more folks to get involved. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Melissa, can I make one suggestion that we stay, even though we can't continue the taping, but yeah. Yeah. Answer, answer the question. Question. Yeah, questions? I have a couple other questions I wouldn't mind asking. That'd be great. And I'll pass yeah. on the information. The, uh, uh, can we talk now? You bet. Go okay. ahead. The, uh, uh, the housing coalition, there was a housing coalition, and there were several uh, participating members of the university, there was the city, the county.